Kicking off our list at number 10, Plasma Shield. You'll need your tinfoil hats for this entire video. I'll just start by saying that. The thumbs up and the tinfoil hats, both equally as important. Billions of miles from the center of our solar system, there is a wall. Big Game of Thrones space wall. Beyond this wall, what's over there? We have no idea, really. It's like the boundaries of an old video game. It's just blurry and it's mysterious. There's some sort of energy that protects us from deep space radiation. There has to be. And when NASA's twin Voyager probes pass through this exact region, only three years ago, astronomers saw that the heliopause is a physical wall of plasma that deflects away the worst radiation in the cosmos. So yeah, a big gooey wall is protecting us from aliens and radiation. That's pretty cool. It's not a hypothetical anymore. The Voyager passed by recently. The shield may actually deflect about 70% of cosmic rays from entering our own solar system. I can't even comprehend the size here. That's just the start too. We're only finding out more things. James Webb, he's here to fuck shit up. Number nine, dead planets. When a star runs out of fuel, it can become a white dwarf. It's the skeleton of a star, essentially. Any planet that's orbiting that star at that point, it's toast. It's probably gonna get wiped out in the final growth spurt of the star. We expect this exact scenario to happen to us here on Earth. We're going to get swallowed by our expanding sun. Yeah, spoilers. Sorry. Either that or its intense gravity would pull us all into our own hot demise. Both pretty bad, but also pretty pretty quick. Only a couple years ago, astronomers discovered an intact planet still orbiting a white dwarf star for the first time ever. This was impossible up until this point. This odd orbit sits 2,040 light years from us here on Earth, and the white dwarf system has its own Neptune-like planet that is slowly evaporating. It's disappearing every 10 days. That's a full orbit over there, just 10 days. Yeah, happy new years, good game. Also, we're disappearing, that's lovely. It's depressing, but this brings light a new theory, that dead stars can actually host planets, even if it's only for a short amount of time. And then, you know, it evaporates us and swallows us whole and burns us. Well, one of the three, it's all gonna suck. Number eight, solar tsunami. I've seen this one here on Reddit a few times and it's baffling each and every time. Some folk on Reddit actually believe that shadow beings live in the sun and that this is actually footage of an alien leaving our sun. Solar flares look odd, but I don't think that it's a quick pit stop for aliens. You know, I'm not totally convinced either way. I don't know. In February, 2019, researchers described a solar phenomenon called Terminator events, which first of all, jarring name, Terminator, okay? These Terminator events are massive magnetic field collisions at the sun's equator. Now, subsequently, these collisions result in twin tsunamis of plasma tearing across the star's surface. It travels at a thousand feet per second. It's pretty fast. It's kind of like the tsunami scene from Interstellar, only way, way worse, totally way worse. Solar tsunamis could last for weeks at a time and may occur once a decade. So keep your eyes peeled. No. No, actually, don't look at the star. Don't look at any star, ever for that matter. Especially not ours, or you'll go blind. Number seven, the Codex Gigas. Basically translates to giant book, Codex Gigas. And it's giant, 170 pounds. It's the largest medieval manuscript in the world. Also known as the Devil's Bible. Yeah, due to the highly detailed full page portrait of Satan himself, the demonology written within, and the legend around its initial creation. Made out of 180 donkeys, the famous myth is that a scribe traded his soul to the Prince of darkness so that he could complete and master the contents of the universe written within this one book. Comprised in only one night. Created in the early 13th century in the Benedictine Monastery of Bohemia, now modern day Czech Republic, this book's creepy. Yeah, it contains the complete Bible, like the Old One and the New Testament, as well as everything medicinal and cosmological that a human would know at Earth at that time. All written in Latin, and of course predated glyphs, and of course missing the last 10 pages of the book. Yep, ripped out and missing. I don't know. Who knows? The book lays in the National Library of Sweden in Stockholm. I wouldn't go near it. I wouldn't read it. I wouldn't even touch it. You know, I'm good with goosebumps. That scares me enough. Number six, the oldest map. A 4,000 year old stone slab first discovered over a century ago in France may be the oldest known map in Europe, according to a new study. The slab dates back to the early Bronze Age, 4,000 years ago. It was first discovered in 1900 in a prehistoric burial site in Finisterre, France. The engravings on the broken stone appear to resemble topographic features including hills, reference points, and river networks. The broken slab, which is four meters long, was moved to a private museum in France in 1924. It was then stored in a French castle where it gathered dust until it was rediscovered in the castle cellar in 2014. But only recently are researchers beginning to understand the actual importance behind this prehistoric slab rock. It's been interpreted as the oldest cartographical map in Europe. Yeah, that's old. Number five, the Voynich Manuscript. There's a giant Italian Renaissance folio called the Voynich manuscript. It's named after Wilfred Voynich, a book dealer who purchased it in 1912 
2012, and to this day, we don't really know what it is. Hands down, the most mysterious book of all time. Not only is it detailed so carefully and patiently, it's basically like a Tim Burton take on a book about life, with an entire world drawn and recorded that isn't ours. Like, parallel universe type stuff. Even the language is unknown. Like, unknown unknown. Like, predates Latin and doesn't use phonetic patterns and coding. The riddle of all riddles. Written somewhere between 1405 and 1450, all 240 pages are inscribed in some sort of indecipherable language of about 170,000 characters. Historians and cartographers have tried to crack the code for hundreds of years, yet not one has been successful. Why wasn't this a national treasure movie? I feel like this would have been perfect, like Nicolas Cage, you know? I don't know. Number four, the Nazca Lines. The ancient, very mysterious geoglyphs that make up the soil of the Nazca Desert in southern Peru is an old one. They were created, we think, somewhere between 1000 BCE and 500 AD. Basically, people would make impressions or shallow incisions on the desert floor, removing pebbles, leaving colored dirt exposed, drawing some sort of depictions of fauna and humanoid scribbles for only those above Earth to visually see. Basically what I'm trying to say here is that these are giant ancient unknown drawings you can only accurately depict from space or from like drones hundreds of miles in the air. In the years leading up to 2020, between 80 and 100 new figures have been found with the use of drones and cameras since at least year 1900. Yo, who's drawing these things? And why is the mountain range just so perfectly square and flat like it's been laser cut to draw on? More than 70 designs are zoomorphic, including birds, spiders, fish, lizards, and of course, humans. Lots of different shapes and clothing and builds of humans. Interesting. It became a UNESCO World Heritage Site in 1994. Yeah, I'd like to think so. I feel like this is going to be on Art Attack. Number three, Apollo 13. April 11th, 1970. Apollo 13 was heading for the moon. Now on board the ship was astronauts James Lovell, John Swigert, and Fred Hayes. 56 hours after takeoff, there was an explosion that damaged the shuttle drastically. Every system to keep the astronauts alive and well were all of a sudden no longer operational. And yes, they were all in space heading towards the moon. So worst scenario possible. The second oxygen tank thermostat had been damaged before the actual launch, and since it blasted off, these astronauts had little to no chance of ever coming home. There's actually a movie about this whole thing, and it's wild. You have to watch it. It's a Tom Hanks classic. No spoilers, but incoming spoilers. Their power supply, water, oxygen, heat, and light all cut off. They had lost over 30 pounds combined. It was horrible. It was just quite the event. The people at NASA's Mission Control Center had to get these guys home and do months work of calculations in only days. Instead of going to the moon, they figured a way to use its pull and then return home as quickly and as safely as possible. So they did a little moon flyby said, oh, would be nice, see ya. Then they flew back, terrified this whole time, and then went back to Earth. Number two, space animals. We often remember Laika, the space dog, and her 103 minute cosmic journey aboard Sputnik 2. But does anybody remember Abel and Baker? Why are we talking about these two? This was the American version of Laika. This was less than two years later, so it wasn't the first animal, so, you know, maybe that's why we don't talk about it. But it was two years later, May 28th, 1959. The United States launched a female rhesus monkey named Abel and a female squirrel monkey named Baker. They launched them both into space. Now this mission only lasted 15 minutes and they both safely returned back home, which is great. You're probably all curious what happened right off the bat. The monkeys weren't injured from their trip, or so they say, although they were whipping through space at 10,000 miles an hour. I highly don't believe that. This was 1959. This was when space travel became the real deal. The impossible became possible. And it was all because of these animals right here. Abel sadly passed away after the flight in, you know, normal ways, nothing to do with the actual flight itself. Meanwhile, Baker, she got famous. She was getting 150 letters a day. I'm talking fan mail. These ladies are icons, okay? Never mind Laika. Laika's time's over, okay? We get it. It was rough rough. We like it. Dog puns. That's why we're here. Hit that thumbs up for dog puns and also animals in space. Number one, Runaway Bride. Back in September 2019, a star was detected at impossible speeds. It was just whipping through the cosmos. It was the fastest renegade star ever recorded so far. Hey, you want to know how fast you were going? It was fleeing across the Milky Way at 1.2 million miles per hour. I'm trying to imagine that and I can't. Where did this even come from? Well, most of the time, these speeds come right after a supernova explosion, but after tracking the the star's velocity and trajectory and going, eh, it came from there. Researchers figured out where it came from. It came from a black hole that's massive. It's hundreds of thousands of times the mass of our own sun 
and this star just got completely sucked in and then launched out at unimaginable speeds. That thing, like, is this gonna hit us? How many more are out there? This is so scary. I'm gonna get out of here right now. I'm feeling a little hot with all these lights. I'm a little scared. Now I'm thinking about space and now I'm anxious. Number 10, the endurance. This one is just incredible. Enter the time of adventurers. When setting sail with a crew of hardy men and the hopes of discovery was just the way of life. What to discover? Well, that's anything and anywhere, friends. Their fame and fortune await. This was true of Sir Ernest Shackleton, a man who was seeking his own destiny and adventure. He famously boarded a ship called the Endurance and with a motley crew set sail for the Antarctic waters. Things were going great until they weren't. That's a classic line, isn't it? The ship got stuck in ice, and despite the crew's best efforts, the ship was beginning to lose its fight and sank. Miraculously though, all crew survived, including Shackleton. Pretty amazing story. The ship was lost under the icy waters for years, thought to be lost forever. That was until March of this year, March of 2022, it was found. And even more surprisingly, she was mostly intact and preserved due to the frigid temperatures of the water. Ooh, nice. Number nine, Rosetta Stone. What if I told you the reason why we understand so much of the ancient world and ancient Egypt is because of a small dictator from France who had an ego issue? Sounds fake, right? Well, actually, it's true. Napoleon Bonaparte, the Corsican ogre as he was also known, during his reign of fame and military power, he went on tour in Egypt. And I mean, why not? It's hot, sunny, and you got those pyramids. How can you say no? It's beautiful. Well, like something out of Call of Duty Zombies, Napoleon took his army boys and a couple of egghead archaeologists to uncover the hidden secrets. That's when the Rosetta Stone was found. A large stone tablet that was inscribed three times with three different languages, but all saying the same thing. Thus, it helped us understand and decipher ancient Egyptian language and unlocked many other secrets as well. Pretty, pretty, pretty shocking find. Number eight, Pompeii. Imagine a sunny day like any other. You're a Roman citizen walking through a market as it hustles and bustles during a bright afternoon. The smell of small restaurants fill the air. The playful sound of friends chatting Way charms the background. Then the ground violently shakes and a thick black ash covers the city. Within a few short hours, like a scene from Revenge of the Sith, lava flows everywhere and the people are buried in burning hot ash and smoke. Oof, no thanks. I don't want the Darth Vader treatment. Pompeii is an interesting story. It wasn't rediscovered in one major excavation, but rather people kept walking over it and going, huh, I wonder what this is. And that's pretty much it. Excavation after excavation eventually led to modern scientists to rediscover discover the city and in a quite well preserved state actually, surprisingly. An ancient restaurant was found not too long ago complete with mosaics. That's pretty cool. That's pretty sweet. Number seven, lost habitable worlds. Remember back in 2020 when we casually discovered phosphine on Venus? Yeah, in the middle of 2020 of all time, data from 40 years ago resurfaced and it was documents from an old NASA mission where they may have overlooked this phosphine for the entire time. Yeah, whoops, didn't see that sign of life there for 40 years. Found it, let's talk. Yeah, this compound of phosphorus and hydrogen, this is eye-opening. So what's next? Well, NASA is interested to say the least. They're currently preparing to launch two new missions to Venus to check this out. This is part of NASA's discovery program that they're launching in 2030, so we still got a little bit of time. The Da Vinci Plus and the Verita S. Now the first one is a deep atmosphere Venus investigation of noble gases, chemistry, and imaging. Kind of a mouthful, but that's why we say Da Vinci. There we go. Then the second one, the second drone, will map Venus's surface and study its geologic history and hopefully get an understanding as to what happened to such a lost habitable world. World. Yeah, maybe there's humans there. Maybe we got old and we died and then we came here. Oh, number six, carbon on Mars. It's one thing to have Elon tweeting about going to Mars, but when NASA talks about it, it's interesting. I get an eerie feeling. I'm like, oh, I kind of believe this a little bit more. Elon's Twitter is a little off the chain, so more than fair. They're old school, you know what I mean? They're like, we may have found carbon 40 years ago. Stay tuned. Papers everywhere. It's so NASA to have papers all over the place when you discover something. Well, in 2022, quite recent, just back in January, NASA's Curiosity rover measured carbon signatures on Mars. And we got Venus, we got Mars. What's next? Earth? Yeah, gotcha. Paul Mahaffey, principal investigator of the sample analysis over at Mars, he says, quote, we're finding things on Mars that are tantalizingly interesting, but we would really need more evidence to say we've identified life. Okay, so we're close. We're definitely close. We need more evidence, not all the evidence. We just need a little bit more. And then we're 
finding aliens up on Mars, the big red planet. Imagine going to Mars with Elon Musk. Like imagine like winning a trip and that's what you get. I would pay millions of dollars to not do that. How does that sound? Number five, asteroid redirection. This one happened like a week ago and it snuck up on all of us. It has Michael Bay written all over it. I was pretty excited for this project, I'm not gonna lie. NASA landing a craft onto a moving asteroid is one thing, but their asteroid redirection mission was next level. Their plan was for NASA to catch an asteroid using hypothetically a large space inflatable. And no, I'm not joking. And then they would move said asteroid to the moon where it would orbit for their studies. Yeah, we're just gonna adopt a rock and then have astronauts land on it and then study the moon. I don't think this is gonna happen, but just last week, NASA landed a craft onto an asteroid. They just blasted an asteroid, so ideally, down the line, if we need to, we can blow an asteroid that's coming towards Earth off its orbit, so it misses us. I don't know. That seems a bit more easy than a giant inflatable catching a rock and then letting it go over here. You know what I mean? Let's just blast the thing. I'm on board with NASA. Number four, the second shortest spacewalk. Luca Parmentano, an Italian astronaut with the European Space Agency, faced what's possibly my new worst fear. I can't imagine anything worse than this. Here we go. It was July 16th, 2013. During a spacewalk on the 36th expedition to the ISS, Luca's helmet began to fill with liquid. Not water, but even worse. It started to fill with liquid coolant. Yeah, zero G coolant floating around inside of your mask. That's horrible. Water would be bad. Coolant, you don't want to breathe or drink this in. It's all bad. But being in space, that's a bit unpredictable. You know what I mean? The spacewalk continued for over an hour before Luca was back in the ISS and free from his suit of doom. He was fine, but this accident could have been a lot worse. The second shortest spacewalk in the station's history. Yeah, more than fair. Imagine drowning in like zero G. Ah. Horrible. Number three, Bigus Chedicus. How many of you folks like cheese? I'm, I'm willing to bet it's a lot of you. I know I do. My favorite is mozzarella, especially from a mom and pop pizza shop or homemade Italian cuisine. Oh, baby, it's the best. I'm not Italian, but I love the communities. Watch out, little Italy, here I come. I'm gonna eat all your pizza. In a recent discovery in Egypt, archaeologists came across ancient cheese, of all things. Who would have thought? Which may be the oldest cheese ever to be found. Estimated to be 3,200 years old and composed of goat's milk. Mm. While it might be tempting to dive in and take a slice of the cheese, oh, yes, as aristocrats are known to do, I would hold back as it is also found to have bacteria called brucellos, which is not good for your health. It will make you very sick, so don't eat it. Number two, I think I stepped in something. I personally find it very fascinating when we dig up something from the past, or really just discover anything from the past. For years, that artifact sat there as the world went on. It's kind of it's a weird thought for me. I don't know. For me, it's even more impressive if the item is in good condition and helps give us a better view into the past. Take the 5,000 year old leather shoe found in an Armenian cave for example. The laces on this bad boy were still in good condition, which is very impressive. It's a long time. So what's the secret? The shoe was found in a pile of ye olde manure. Supposedly this had some sort of restorative properties on the shoe, although I'm not rushing to try it and I don't recommend anyone else does either. Number 1. Turkish Delight In 1963, a man was doing renovations on his home. After a trip in 1960, Turkish Home Depot, he began his work. After knocking down a wall, he found a hidden room, which then led to a tunnel. And that tunnel led to the lost city of Derinkuyu. Yes, this man had a whole ancient city right underneath him. Honey, there's an ancient city beneath us! The city proved to be massive, with an estimated population of 20,000 people, complete with livestock. Uh, they weren't there, obviously, it's just the, what they thought it would hold. So, for those of our viewers living in older homes, make sure to check behind your walls. You may have some secrets hidden there. Ooh, That'd be cool. Number 10, T-Rex arms. All right, mystery solved, folks. Have you ever wondered why a T-Rex, one of the biggest, baddest dinosaurs in the game, have you ever wondered why their arms are so tiny? What went wrong here? How did they get the short end of the DNA dino stick? Well, scientists may have an answer. They've spent decade after decade debating T-Rex arms, which, first of all, it's a great job. And now, at first, previous hypotheses suggested that their arms may have been used as pectoral claspers during mating, or to get off the ground after falling over, both hilarious in a sense. But even so, there's other parts of the body that would have been used in that scenario, so it's almost like they're still useless. New studies this year suggest that these arms getting smaller was actually perfect. The arms of the T-Rex shriveled because there is an evolutionary advantage to keeping them out of the way. T-Rex, yeah, they would eat in groups. So more often than not, these idiots would bite their friend's arms off or their own. Yeah, so they shriveled them up, kept them out of the way. Bob's your uncle. You ever bite your own finger while you're eating food? 
That's a personal embarrassing moment. Number nine, Garfield phones. Okay, hello, look who's calling. The Garfield crave began back in 1978. Jim Davis brought to life this lasagna-loving, Monday-hating cats, the OG grumpy cat, really. And as his popularity grew, of course, so did his merch. A Garfield couch with eyes, that's really anybody wants, right, in life? But the last thing you would expect to find floating in the ocean are probably Garfield phones. Also, yes, I said phones, not one phone. Thousands of Garfield phones have been slowly washing up ashore in France for 30 years now. Imagine standing there looking at the ocean, thinking about your ex, pondering life, and then a Garfield phone washes up. You're like, ugh, fine, I'll call her. This began in the 80s, but until recently, we didn't know where they were coming from, which is pretty jarring. A farmer read about these phones in an article and how they could, you know, be hurting the environment, and he came forward and admitted he knew about the shipping container full of Garfield phones. Rene Morvin, this guy's been sitting on a national treasure, this huge secret. He says in the 80s, he found the shipping container in a sea cave, which, I mean, imagine thinking you found some sort of lost billions worth of treasures, but it's just this If the ocean gives you plastic phones, you answer it. Number eight, holes. If you have trypophobia, you may want to skip this one, I'm not gonna lie, it's pretty, it's pretty odd. Off the coast of Big Sur, California, a survey revealed about 15,000 holes, all underwater, just on the ocean floor. For some reason, they're all the same size and they all measure up to be around 11 meters wide and one meter deep. Now the team at Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, they found 15,000 of these and they found 5,000 more that are even larger. They're called micro depressions and the big ones are called pockmarks. Initially, scientists thought that methane under the seafloor, it was just coming out to say hello. Maybe that's the reason for these indents. And then they, of course, left a crater. Rovers went down there, tests were done. Turns out that's not the case. No methane is involved. In fact, there hasn't been any methane down there for 50,000 years. These MDs are essentially garbage trails and now there's deep sea creatures living in them. It's like a little underwater neighborhood, it's cute. They even found a whale skull just laying in one of them. Can you imagine that? Imagine being a crab and coming home to that. I'd move. I'd move to the next micro depression immediately. Number seven, the Terracotta Army. Well, we all have that favorite thing we love. For me, it's, it's video games. I, I love video games. I'd say comedy, but it's kind of hard to take that with you when you pass away. I'll try though, we'll see. For years, kings and leaders tried their best to take things with them in the afterlife. Egyptians were so worried they had to take their cats and dogs with them, or at least they tried. They did. Well, very famously, the first emperor of China tried to take a terracotta army with him. Or rather, an army to protect him in the afterlife. Yes, Emperor Qin was famously buried with soldiers to protect him in the afterlife. Thing is, this wasn't a handful we're talking about, but hundreds in all shapes and sizes, which is really crazy, actually. Discovered by farmers attempting to dig a well in 1974, they came to unmask a huge burial site with soldiers and cavalry, all with bronze swords that were quickly looted. It makes sense. It's one of the biggest discoveries of all time. In the archaeology department, at least. Pretty cool. Pretty sick. Number six, the Nazca Lines. At some point, there was a dude walking in the southern Peruvian desert and saw some lines on the ground and thought, gee, those are some funny looking lines there, huh? And when he went to a higher elevation and looked back at it, well, it looked like it was a larger image, he must have thought to himself. Ah, it's probably nothing. Well, once humans had gained the ability to fly, the images were much clearer. In a large portion of the Peruvian desert are long but shallow trenches dug in the ground. The resulting product is images and that of Mesoamerican drawings of animals, like a spider, a monkey, and a bird, and most recently, a cat. It's weird. It's weird animals in the ground. I don't know. It's just kind of strange. Question is, who done it? That is the question. That's always the question for archaeology, isn't it? No one is really sure who done it, actually. And it also begs the question, if you were to dig all these drawings, who would see them but God and or aliens? That's kind of a weird thing to understand. Who would see that? No one's up there back then, right? Strange. Number five, Titanic. Before 1997, the Titanic was one of those aquatic mysteries. For those that have been captivated by its sinking from stories and tales from survivors, people wanted to know her final resting place. And yes, I know it wasn't 1997, but that was when every person on planet Earth knew what the Titanic was. Thanks to Terminator director James Cameron. Kind of a weird thing to do after Terminator, but okay. And teenage heartthrob Leonardo DiCaprio. And maybe, maybe a lady, but you know, you know what I'm talking about. It was actually rediscovered on September 1st, 1985 at 3,500 meters below the ocean surface, which if you didn't know, is, a, is, pretty deep, is pretty deep down there. It's not every day you discover an unsinkable ship thought to be lost forever at the bottom of the ocean. 
Pretty exciting. Number four, remains of Richard III. Richard III, the king of England and Ireland. And if you go by how Shakespeare describes him, well, he's a rotten man, he is, sir. A hunchback with an irregular walk. In real life, well, not so much. But that's because Shakespeare wrote it during the time period when the monarch was the monarch to got rid of the monarch that was Richard III's. Monarch. It's just good politics, it makes sense. Despite what Shakespeare said about him, he still wasn't great. Who was back then? No one really was. During the many years since the Mad King's passing, it seems his remains were lost. Until one day in 2014, his remains were dug up in a parking lot, of all places. Who would have thought? Just where a king like that would have wanted to be. Kind of strange to dig up one of the country's kings on the job, of a, on the day of a construction job. It's kind of weird. You know, you're just an average day and you're like, oh, there's a former king of England. Cool. You know what I mean? It's kind of weird. Number three. Raining spiders. Back in 2015, and you guessed it, Australia, residents of Goulburn woke up to the town just being caked in spiders. This is my nightmare. This is, I think, yeah, this is my absolute biggest fear. Everything was webbed. They were tiny black spiderlings all over the place. Resident Ian Watson told reporters that, quote, when I looked up at the sun, it was like this tunnel of webs going up for a couple of hundred meters into the sky. End quote. Also, delete memory. Thanks. Rick Vetter, an entomologist at the University of California at Riverside, says that many spiders are just ballooning around us, but thankfully, they all don't do it at the same time, like this situation. Yeah, this is happening all the time, so keep your heads up or down. I'd rather not look. Number two, giant pipes. Back in 2017, these massive industrial pipes washed up along the shores of the northern Norfolk coast. Now, if I was swimming and I saw this thing floating towards me, I would faint. I would think it's a giant sea snake or something. I would have no idea what I was looking at. These things were massive. Terrible discovery, but again, pretty exciting. I didn't realize how big these were at first, and then I zoomed in. I think I have some mechanophobia now. Where did they come from? Well, these pipes were lost at sea following an accident on an Iceland shipping container, which resulted in 500 meter long pipes coming loose. Yeah, that's so scary. Luckily, you can see these things coming, but that's still jarring. I would think it's a submarine emerging out of the water. God. The company that produced them, Pipe Life, Great name, rather fitting. They urge the curious to stay far away. Do not approach them. You can see them coming because they're the size of buildings, so they can obviously easily crush a human being. These ocean pipes have a diameter of two meters, and the longest one that washed up on the beach was 500 meters long. Number one, three kittens. Back in 2020, an oil worker named Drayton Dewich found three kittens all frozen to the ground near Drayton Valley. They were alive, but just, you know, very cold. It was mid-January, everything is frozen. This was near an oil well that he'd been working on, right? Those are always freezing cold. On Facebook, they posted about how the three kittens were all males, dewormed and living under the same roof now, and they were much warmer. He just found three little pets and brought them home. He got them out of the ice by using coffee to melt the ice. That's amazing. I said it once before and I'll say it again, coffee saves lives. Kicking off our list at number 10, Western Camel Bones. Scientific name being Camelops hesternus, meaning yesterday's camel in Latin. There's a fun fact. Now these bones first appeared in 2008 when gold miners were working in Hunter Creek. It was only 60 miles away from the Alaskan border. But all of a sudden they stumbled across these massive bones, ancient bones. The last time these bones were operating on, you know, actual limbs, was 75 to 125,000 years ago. Isn't that incredible? The remains were in such great condition because of the awful surrounding conditions. It was so cold that scientists could actually still extract DNA, which told us that 10 million years ago, roughly, Western camels split from modern day camels. Yeah, we had more camels, now we don't have many camels. Sads. The more camels, the better. Number nine, Allen Hill's meteorite. All right, this one's for all the space nerds. This next one is literally out of this world. Back in December 1984, American meteor hunters discovered this fragment in Allen Hills, Antarctica. Now this meteor was appropriately named Allen Hills 48001, which is, okay, let's break to the point. Now this rock was speculated to come from Mars. And in 1996, a scientist claimed that he discovered bacteria from the microscopic fossils on this meteorite. Now the news of course spread quickly and everybody started to lose their minds. You know, rightfully so, this is a while ago. Bill Clinton even chimed in. He made a speech about possible discoveries in space with aliens and sh The scientific community later said this was not the case after further studies, but never say never. Feels like we're getting closer to finding life now with James Webb. I don't know, every time I click refresh, it's like, check out this thing that's in the past. I'm like, what? Number eight, more meteorites. 
For this one, we'll switch it up. This time, scientists found ice in meteorite. Nice, it's always a good time. James Webb is about to hopefully show us how much water is in space, and I personally am not ready for it. Back in 1990, after the 094 meteorite was discovered in the Algerian mountains, the rock was dated back to 4.6 billion years ago. So scientists studied the meteorite with synchrotron radiation-based X-ray nanotomography, leading scientists to find evidence of tiny pores. Pores believed to have been fossilized ice crystals. That's fun, that's, again, space aliens with water. Who knows, hopefully. These pores have come from when the meteorite crossed the snow line in space. Now the snow line is a sphere around the sun. It's the exact point where ice on meteorites melts. It's pretty cool. The study was to hopefully find out where water comes from in that galaxy, and it seems that it came from a lot further than we all thought, which is comforting, I guess. Yeah, there's water in space, it's just, you know, way the fuck out there. Number seven, Amelia Earhart remains. The first woman to fly across the Atlantic was well on her way to setting even more groundbreaking records, but her plane tragically disappeared over the Pacific in 1937. And it's since been a great mystery where the final resting place of Amelia Earhart now is. But we may have actually found her remains back in 1940 without really knowing. They were found on the Pacific island of Nakumaroro. Now the initial examination of these remains were reported to be that of a man. That was the general idea in 1941. Come 2018, however, now we have a different idea. Could it be? Researcher Richard Johns took another look at the long lost remains, and since those days, we've learned more about Amelia Earhart. Photos have since surfaced online, so we compared the bone measurements to her body type, and they're pretty sure that they found our missing aviator. Number six, abandoned whiskey. This one's pretty fun, dare I say, a little exciting? I don't know. An explorer found crates in a hut belonging to another explorer, that of Ernest Shackleton. You've probably heard of him before, it's pretty huge. Anything belonging to our boy Ernest Shackleton is a treasure, especially when it's frozen bottles of scotch. That's pretty lovely. It's probably the best case scenario, really, evidently. It's 2010 and you find 100 year old frozen scotch that Ernest Shackleton once drank. What do you do? Do you drink it? Do you save it? A little bit of both. I would do a bit of both. This may be the best discovery on this list, or at least the happiest. It's been locked up, of course, since, you know, such a historical find, but you'll be happy to know that a sample was given to Scottish distiller White and McKay. They're now studying this recipe to try and bring it back to life, which is amazing. Number five, surprise Nikes. I threw shoes on my holiday wish list this year, and every year for that matter. Nothing like a nice fresh pair of sneaks. Sometimes you find the perfect shoes, and sometimes they find you. In the mid 90s, a shipment of Nike shoes heading to the US was lost during this crazy storm. Around five shipping containers fell into the sea, so later on, 61,000 pairs of shoes just started to drift towards the west coast. Just all mar just making their little way, just slowly but surely. That's terrifying. People saw shoes in the water. Do you know how afraid I would be if a shoe brushed against my shoulder while I was swimming? My brain would go to the darkest places. So scary. These shoes luckily didn't belong to anybody, but they did all have the same serial number by chance. So what started as this ocean mystery ended up working out for the better. Nike lost a lot of money and we tracked the shoe's journey. So now we oddly learned more about our ocean currents. Well, Nike lost money. Win-win. Number four, 2021 rocket. Remember last year in May when a large piece of space junk was just gonna crash land somewhere on Earth and we had no idea where it was gonna hit? Possible Avengers level threat. We're all just looking at Twitter, refreshing, like, mm, where's it gonna be? Where did it land? Well, at the time, this was one of the biggest pieces of human-made space junk to ever crash towards Earth, so it was a little jarring. They said it would land in New York or New Zealand. One of the two, okay, gamble, let's do it, 50-50. The debris came from the lost March 5B rocket and landed in the Indian Ocean, luckily, with most of it burning up upon re-entry. Now, usually, when rockets discard pieces, it's done so strategically, falling into the ocean, normally the Atlantic, in a graveyard, this was not supposed to happen. Thankfully, it didn't land in New York. That, again, would have been terrifying. It would look like Loki's arrived. What's, what's that, is that a meteor? Are we done? Number three. Ice Age art. More ancient artwork, but this time we're going to the Colombian Amazon. Now the thing is, unlike other drawings found in the ceilings of tombs or anything like that, this frozen canvas stretches about eight miles. It's incredible. The paintings inside, they're even more impressive. Dating back to 12,000 years ago, these were made near the end of the last ice age. Thousands of paintings, by the way, not just a handful of arrows, nothing like that, just a huge canvas. These were found in 2017, so pretty recently, but it was only last year where they finally went public with these Arctic findings. Now the findings being, you know, paintings of elephants, massive 
massive sloths, horses from the Ice Age, snakes, birds, deer, that kind of stuff. This is now one of the largest collections of rock art in South America. Yeah, pregnant women or the origins of the Ninja Turtles? I don't know, I'm on the fence, you tell me. Number two, the Glacier Girl. Now before you get worried, no, this next one is not a real person, this next one is a plane. A P-23 aircraft was discovered in Greenland surrounded in ice. Now during World War II in July 1942, six P-38 fighter planes were ordered to make an emergency landing in Greenland due to lousy weather conditions and of course low visibility. Now the crew was thankfully saved, but the Lockheed had to be abandoned, never to be seen again for now 50 years. Recently it was dug out of 264 feet of snow and ice. It took years to get this plane back up, but now she of course is known as the Glacier Girl, and in 2017, Lewis Energy CEO Rodney Lewis, he bought this plane. Yeah, they just brought a plane out of the ice, and this guy's like, yeah, I'll buy it, debit, no problem. And finally, number one, a preserved mammoth cub. In 2010, a mummified mammoth cub was discovered in Siberia, right off the coast of Oyogos, named after a nearby village, Yuka, this newfound cub, is now the best preserved mammoth cub discovered in history. Now this was a fascinating find that should have never been seen again, let alone found in such great condition. It's kind of haunting when you look at it, it still looks alive, you know what I mean? But apparently that's not the end of woolly mammoths. Who knew? It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal, they're now planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. For reasons, you know, for science reasons. The last mammoth to walk the planet alive was around 10,500 years ago, but what if they were alive today? Colossal raised over $15 million and now they're working on reviving that woolly mammoth. They're doing this to ideally decelerate the melting of the Arctic permafrost and to save modern elephants from extinction and of course to advance CRISPR editing. We love science, maybe a little too much, I don't know. Is it a good idea to bring the woolly mammoth back to life or are we just, I don't know, setting them up for another slow, horrible demise once again? Number 10, Serpent Mound. The Great Serpent Mound is a 1,400 foot long, three foot high prehistoric effigy located in Peebles, Ohio, United States. Serpent Mound was first reported via surveyors Ephraim Squire and Edwin Davis and was featured in their Ancient Monuments of Mississippi book back in 1848. Looks just like a regular golf course, doesn't it? But underneath, it's perfectly placed and well-preserved earth formations that were made by hand to align with something in the sky. The mound is the largest serpent effigy in the world. Yeah, big snake. The mound itself winds back and forth for more than 800 feet with its tail coiling in seven different areas. Tons of Clovis era spearheads have been found that indicate interaction with with other groups of ancient humans, along with the Denisovans and the Neanderthals. Archaeologists believe that the mound's creation was influenced by two astronomical events. The light from the supernova Crab Nebula in 1054 and Halley's Comet in 1066. The mound is also located on an ancient meteorite impact location, which makes things absolutely way scarier. In 2003, geologists from Ohio State University and Glasgow said the meteorite impact origin of the structure at Serpent Mound is the best evidence for its build and importance. Yeah, nothing crazy, just a mile long cosmically aligned serpent made out of rocks, made from prehistoric dudes who could barely work fire right on top of a huge impact location. Yeah. Something's fishy here. Number nine, the Terracotta Army. Hey, if you dig what we do here on Bumblebee, make sure you hit us up with a like button or comment down below which discovery in ancient history has you laying awake at night. I know mine. Let me know, I'll check it out. The Terracotta Army, don't even get me started, was first discovered in 1974 by a group of farmers east of the Queen Emperor's Tomb Mound at Mount Lee. For centuries, reports mentioned pieces of the terracotta fragments found, roofing tiles, bits of brick, masonry, but when they discovered heads of clay bodies, yeah, the Chinese archeologists started to investigate and dig a little bit deeper. To this day, it remains the largest pottery group ever found on Earth. The Terracotta Army is a collection of sculptures depicting the armies of the Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor of China. Apparently a form of funerary art buried with the emperor around 209 BCE with the purpose of protecting him in the afterlife. 8,000 soldiers, 130 chariots, 520 horses, and 150 cavalry. Yeah. That's a lot of protection. The site is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site and has been since 1987. I'm just getting Medusa vibes when I look at this, you know? Like, I'm not convinced the actual purpose of this operation. Like, was it a front? Were they once alive? Who knows, dude? This place is mysterious.
but cool. Number eight, the Antikythera mechanism. The Antikythera mechanism is an anomaly ancient computer that uses the cosmos to predict astronomical events. A group of sea sponge divers discovered the Antikythera shipwreck in early 1900 just off the island in Greece. Hence, the name. I find it funny that divers diving for something you wipe your butt with found an ancient computer just chilling down there. Something about that makes me laugh. Many think it's cursed too due to its first handlings. Apparently after its discovery, three of the divers who dove down died shortly after its find. 150 feet deep just off Point Glyphadia, the team retrieved millions in worth of bronze, marble, pottery, glassware, jewelry, coins, and of course, this ancient MacBook. This device is made entirely out of a single bronze sheet built within a wooden case about the size of a shoebox. Faces and cogs covered in Greek inscriptions indicating the device's astronomical calendar, purpose, use, basically everything we have on our iPhone right now within this wooden box 2200 years ago. Yeah, again, collecting sea sponges to wipe our butts with and then just stumbling upon a computer. I don't know, someone's getting a raise, I'll say that. Number seven, viruses. We're all talking about an ancient virus that's coming back now, some ancient mummified frozen virus. Sounds like we're doomed. Just over a year ago in China, scientists discovered an ancient virus. These samples came from the Tibetan Plateau, and the samples were originally collected back in 2015. Now the contents date back to around 14,400 years ago, long before Captain America went into the ice. And there's dust, gases, and of course, viruses over that long accumulated time, and glaciers just soaked it all in, right? Layer after layer, pushing history deeper into its icy core until scientists come in with a few mega drills. Now we're finding dinosaurs, we're finding bones, and also sometimes we find 33 viruses. Yeah, 33, that's like two more than my family computer had growing up. That's a lot of viruses. Four of these viruses typically infect bacteria and the rest were novel, which means that it's never been seen before. Yeah, how neat is that? Novel viruses, just what the world needs right now. Number six. Otzi the Iceman. Discovered in September 1991, this mummy was found on the border of Austria and Italy. He's Europe's oldest known natural mummy. It's pretty amazing. He was covered in ice shortly after his death, so most of the 45-year-old man from the Copper Age was left in rather good condition. A 5,000-year-old man was found in ice. You know, you lose this round, Captain America. Again, I'm just saying. I really thought I'd put you on this list, not this time. Before we passed in the Italian Alps, Otzi had a number of health problems, it seems, that we've now found many years later. He had arthritis, Lyme disease, and he was lactose intolerant. Thanks to science, we now know that Otzi the Iceman was sharpening his tools right before his death. So, he fought till the end. What an OG. Number five, underneath Thwaites Glacier. We've seen some fascinating stuff here on B. You know, I do my best, specifically underwater footage. I know that gives us all the creeps. We love exploring the deeps for some reason, and this next one, I couldn't believe, honestly. You're about to see footage from the bottom of an Antarctic glacier, so buckle up. This glacier is the size of Florida, so if it collapses at any point in our time, our sea levels could rise 10 feet. And in 2019, researchers drilled 2,300 feet through the middle of Thwaites Glacier. Then they dropped a robot with a camera right down and they saw this. For the first time ever, we've now seen the grounding zone of Thwaites Glacier. Lead scientist Brittany Schmidt says this project is a dream come true, and I can't agree more. It's her walking on the moon moment, and I cannot agree more. This feels like another universe, almost. This looks like the upside down. This is terrifying. There's only one meter of space between the bottom of the glacier and the rocky seafloor, so think about that when you sleep tonight. Number four. Message in a bottle. Back in 1959, a geologist named Paul Walker, no, not that one, not even close, he decided to bury a message in a bottle. And he wanted to make a lasting statement about climate change, so he put this frozen message underneath rocks near a glacier in 1959, and then cut to 2013, well, what do we find again? We find Paul Walker's message in a bottle. The message inside was measurements, and to be exact, it was the length from the exact point of the bottle to the edge of a nearby glacier. But by 2013, many, many years later, said glacier had shrunk down 200 feet, so now the glacier was much further. A lasting statement indeed, I would say. Good call, Paul Walker. Number three, the mother of dragons. Mary Anning was an English fossil collector, dealer, and paleontologist who became famously known around the world for her discoveries in Jurassic marine fossil beds in the cliffs along the English Channel 
channel at Lyme Regis in southwest England. I'm not talking about finding a tooth or something. She found three species of dinosaurs. Like three different species o dinosaur. Anning's findings contributed to a massive scientific research pushing prehistoric academia towards the future. In 1811, when Mary was only 12, she found a bizarre fossilized skull. Mary then searched for and dug the outline of its 5.2 meter long skeleton, and by the time she was done, everyone in the town knew that she had discovered something important. Scientists thought this was some sort of ancient crocodile. People were puzzled. Ten years later, she discovers a completely new skeleton of plesiosaur. Two years later, she found one with wings. Today, the Natural History Museum in London showcases several of Mary Anning's historic finds, including her ichthyosaurus, plesiosaur, and pterosaur. Dude, there needs to be like at least three movies about her on Netflix, no? Like Jurassic Park, England. Number two, Gobekli Tepe. This mysterious ancient site in the southeastern Anatolia region of Turkey is dated between 1000 and 12,000 BCE. The site comprises of a number of large man-made structures supported by massive stone megalithic pillars. Gobekli Tepe, or known simply as Potbelly Hill, is the oldest place of which megaliths were mounted. The oldest like ever, and most confusing. Pillars richly decorated with promorphic details, clothing, wild animals, fauna, star systems. Archaeologists are puzzled, to say the least. Famous German archaeologist Klaus Schmidt views Gobekli Tepe as a Stone Age sanctuary. Radiocarbon dating indicates that it contains the oldest known ruins that holster butchered bones of not only deer, but pigs, birds, geese, fish. They've been identified as cooked food, prepared for large groups as festivals or feasts. Yeah, they don't really know exactly what this place was used for, but after finding all this academia and scientific knowledge, it's certain that this place was used by scholars of high order to either teach or study the skills of masonry, as well as the cosmos. And it's only been about a tenth discovered so far. Yeah, just about one tenth. Who knows what other secrets Gobekli Tepe has to unveil? Let's get those other nine tenths uh, undug, no? And the number one spot, ancient Greek shipwreck. The oldest ancient Greek shipwreck ever discovered in the Black Sea, and you would never guess by looking at it. This ship is from 400 BC. It's an ancient Greek trading vessel. Not huge, but somehow, this ship has been kept in almost perfect condition for over 2,400 years, a mile below the sea surface. The lack of oxygen actually preserved the ship, and that's why it looked like it sank last year, and not thousands of years. Ago. John Adams, principal investigator with the Black Sea Archaeology Project, describes the finding as something he never thought was even possible, let alone something he'd witnessed with his own eyes in his lifetime. This discovery changed what we know about ships in the ancient world. It is to date the oldest intact shipwreck ever known to mankind. It can't be beat. This thing is older than most curses. I say pull it up, slap some paint on her, get her going again, no? Quality versus quantity back then? Things were just built to last back then. Yeah.